and uh, extract as much information from it as you possibly can. Lord Alton. Thank you, Lord Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses. And indeed, uh, Professor Haynes has partly answered what I wanted to ask now in my question, but perhaps I can invite Professor Fitzmaurice also to address what have been the successes and the accomplishments of UNCLOS over these past 40 years. And you preempted my second question, really, which is, is it fit for purpose in 2021? And you said that later in, in our discussion you're going to enlarge on that. But maybe perhaps Professor Fitzmaurice could address it now. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, Professor Haynes made some critical comments <coughs> which are justified about the law of the Sea Convention. However, I will try to be a bit more positive. And I will say that the law of the Sea Convention is an umbrella treaty. It means that it has rules and regulations which bring into the fault of the Convention also other um, organizations and it, uh, the law of the Sea Convention managed to um, create a system of law of the sea through the framework, um, uh, through the whole network yeah. nexus of uh, certain provisions. And this is something which also touches upon the question three, why, the, why UNCLOS is a living treaty. Uh, there are some um, uh, provisions which with permission I want to uh, quote, which relate, for instance, to um, this kind of, uh, which are formulated in the following way. Um, in one of the articles, UNCLOS says that states acting through the uh, competent international organization will establish, shall establish international rules and standards to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment <coughs> from vessels and promote the adoption. And this is, I think, a very important provision because under international organization, it's understood international maritime organization, and the uh, uh, general rules and provisions refer to in relation to pollution from ships, relate to global convention, so-called MARPOL convention, on prevention of pollution from ships, uh, which 99% of states uh, with commercial tonnage are parties to this. It's truly global convention. <coughs> and I will say, if I have time later, also very important in, protect, in uh, protection against climate change. So, this is very important. Uh, I, uh, the, the formulation of the convention which allows the other institutions and other conventions to participate in development of the law of the sea, i.e. to make UNCLOS truly a living city, a treaty. Second, I would say that this um, concept of the uh, common heritage of humankind is also in re acquiring a, a, a really realistic shape because um, it was an advisory opinion uh, rendered by the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which um, clarified responsibilities of states giving licenses for the exploration and exploitation of the area for the benefit of the whole mankind, with particular uh, place of developing states. And this is also, I would like to say that this is an important element of the convention, which obviously was started to be negotiated in 74, when our uh, whole perception of the position of developing states was different. However, already the law of the sea convention in very many provisions, um, especially, um, I think, formulated special position of developing states. Also, I must say that this convention was based on modern principles of general environmental law, like environmental impact assessment. So I think that it has done a lot to streamline law of the sea, to bring everything together under the umbrella and to actually help states 
to achieve a unachievable, i.e., for instance, the pollution from ships. It's now only 15% of the whole pollution through actually linking the law of the Sea Convention with the convention which is managed under auspices of the International Maritime Organization. Can I ask if you were to put yourselves in our place as parliamentarians, mm -hmm. perhaps with the opportunity to make a recommendation, a specific recommendation, to improve this living treaty, what would it be that you would say to us we should be recommending to the government? What would be realistic and achievable? I lead off here. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, that, 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 that's a really pertinent question. And before coming to the committee today, I, and I've given some thought as to what might be realistic, because what isn't realistic is to completely renegotiate the convention. That's a, that's a non-starter. There is going to be no one plus four to produce a replacement convention. So we have what we have. And what we have to do is act within its framework as far as possible, whilst developing, to a certain extent, customary law, uh, to modify and move it into the, move it into the future. I, I think what I would like to see, and, and, and we're really concerned about what the UK could do in this context, uh, the UK as uh, one of the, I would say, top five major maritime powers in the world today for a variety of different reasons, uh, is in a very good position to lead on <coughs> a number of things. And what I would focus on, I think, if I were trying to recommend things to government at the moment, is to look at what in the convention looks backwards and what is it that acts as a break on the sensible development of sound ocean governance. And in that context, I would look very seriously at the concept of free seas, and I would be very critical of the concept of free seas, which is often referred to in, in, by the Latin phrase mare liberum, often mistaken for freedom of navigation. They're not the same thing. They're not synonymous. Um, but looking at that issue of free seas and what it means, because <coughs> an awful lot of regulation, and, and, and what Margoshi has said is absolutely correct. There are lots of positive things in the convention from a pollution, environmental, uh, biodiversity, uh, so on. And so, that there are many things that are positive. The unfortunate thing about a lot of these positive things is they are positive on paper, but they're unenforceable. And one of the reasons why they're unenforceable is because there is a vacuum in jurisdictional terms, particularly on the high seas, where a lot of these problems are profoundly significant. Um, we're going through the process at the moment, the United Nations is going through the process of negotiating a biodiversity convention for the high seas. If you look through that biodiversity convention draft, you will find nothing in that about enforcement and compliance with any regulations yes. that will come out of it. Now, no legislator, and you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, are, are legislators in this, in, this, in this house, you would not bring into law a law that is unenforceable. Well, that is what international law is replete with, frankly, and the law of the sea is one of those areas where negotiations <coughs> are conducted, they are successfully completed, treaties are signed and ratified, and yet nothing is put in place to enforce the regulations that flow from them. And that's my big criticism of the current law of the sea. The convention froze, in, in a sense, the concept of free seas. The major powers tried to do that in 1958 at UNCLOS 1, and they tried to stem the tide of uh, ocean uh, encl uh, enclosure subsequently. They came into UNCLOS 3. The developing states had their agenda, the major maritime powers, and they, there was a, a, a really quite remarkable mix of maritime powers cooperating with each other, the Soviet Union, the United States, the United Kingdom, cooperating as major maritime powers, seeing their interests at stake. And they froze into the convention the notion of high seas freedom. And that is causing me, personally, a lot of concern because it's led to the lack of enforcement, not only in terms of biodiversity, the environment, and so on, but also in terms of the way that people are treated globally in the ocean environment. Um, very big concern of mine, which, again, I can expand upon if you want me to. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I think that was very helpful. I'm going to move on to Lord Campbell, if I may. At this